In this video, we want to talk about how firms that are in perfectly competitive markets make decisions. So we're going to think about how they choose what quantity to produce that maximizes their profit. In our previous chapter, we talked about the costs of production. And so we're going to use what we learned in that chapter and we're going to combine it with the revenue information for a competitive, competitive firm and we'll think about how the firm makes its decisions. So let's review quickly the characteristics of this type of market. So in terms of a perfectly competitive market, you already know two of them. We're going to add a third one, but the first two that you know, there are lots of buyers and sellers. And each buyer and seller is small compared to the size of the market. So remember that a good example of a perfectly competitive market would be the gasoline market. And so each of us are small compared to the size of the market. I don't buy enough gas to have any impact on the price of gas. You don't either. So there are lots and lots of buyers and sellers. And then the goods offered for sale are identical. So I'm just going to say the goods are identical. Remember the discussion that we had in a previous video where we talked about the fact that what matters here is not literally whether the goods are identical, but whether or not consumers perceive them as being identical. So a good example of that is, is we talked about aspirin and we talked about gasoline. And so what's important here is that consumers believe that the goods are identical. Okay. Now there's going to be a third characteristic that we're going to add here and that there, the third one is that there are no barriers to entry. No barriers to entry. Sometimes you will hear me call or textbooks just call this free entry. Now let's think about what that means. So if you wanted to start a business, free entry means that you can start a business. There's not anything that prohibits you from doing it. Of course, you have to obey all the rules. You have to have a business license and you've got to pay your taxes and, and you've got to follow the laws, but there's nothing that prohibits you from starting a business. Okay, so there's free entry. Um, so if we think about what these three characteristics together imply, actually, let's think about what these two imply. Remember that anytime there are a lot of buyers and sellers and the goods are identical, then both the buyers and the sellers are price takers. So I'm going to say buyers and sellers are price takers. That means they take prices given. That does not mean that price never changes. Every once in a while I'll have a student that mistakes this for me saying that the price does not change. The price will change. We've talked about what happens in a market if demand changes or supply changes. It's going to change the intersection of the demand and supply curve. It's going to change the price. What we're saying here is that the buyers and the sellers just take that as given. It's not under their control. Now let's talk about in terms of a particular firm what this means. This means if we think about the, uh, the demand curve that a particular firm faces, this means that each particular firm, if I were to label this a firm, the demand curve that a particular firm faces is perfectly elastic at the market price. There's the demand curve that this firm faces and here's the market price. The example that I would have used back, you if you've been listen, watching the videos, then you've heard this example before. In a face-to-face -face class, the way that I would motivate this is to, to say, let's suppose that all of you are selling the exact same thing. There's lots of you, and you're all sitting in a room, and you're all selling, say, these pens. So you've got a box of these pens in front of you, and all of you have a price of a dollar. Well, if if uh, I walk into the room to buy a pen from you and you see me walking up to you and you say to yourself, oh, here comes Dr. Azevedo, I'm going to gouge him a little bit. And when I walk up to you, you say, oh, for you the price is $1.50, then I'm just going to step to the person next to you and buy it for a dollar. So in this case, if you try to raise your price any above the market price, you sell nothing. 
So at this price, you sell zero and this price, you sell zero and that price right there, you sell zero. But as long as you charge the market price, there are enough buyers in the market that you can sell all you want. There are lots and lots of buyers. So you can sell this quantity at that price, or you can sell that quantity at that price. Or you can sell some quantity way out here at that price. Okay. So the demand curve that you face is perfectly elastic. Now we are not saying that the market demand for this good is perfectly elastic. Let me draw you a little picture here that relates this to the market. If I were to um, draw a picture of the market right here and then a picture of the situation that the firm is in, our market's going to look like this. We've got a market demand curve and a market supply curve. Here's price and quantity. And right there is the equilibrium price. And this demand curve right here is not perfectly elastic. It's just downward sloping. But what that results in is that the demand curve that each firm faces, a different demand curve, it's perfectly elastic at the market price. So this is the market and right here would be a, the particular firm that we're talking about, QP. So each firm faces a perfectly elastic demand curve. Remember that the examples that we typically use in a classroom about what perfect competition looks like out there in the real world, there aren't a ton of examples. Um, the stock market is a good example of a perfectly competitive firm or market. Um, commodity markets like uh, corn and soybeans, those are often used as examples of perfectly competitive markets. And then we could think about the gasoline market, but we have to be careful there because if we're talking about a small town with just a couple of sellers, just a couple of gas stations, then we're violating that, that uh, assumption. But if we're talking about a bigger town or a city that's got lots of gas stations, then it's going to behave very much like a perfectly competitive market. Let's talk about the revenue of a competitive firm. So we know, so let's think about revenue. We know that the profit of a firm is equal to total revenue minus total cost. We've seen that before. We spent a previous video talking all about how costs behave. Now we're going to think about how revenue behaves. And once we understand how revenue behaves, we can put those together and we can see how a firm's going to uh, maximize profit. So revenue, total revenue is just price times quantity. And then we're going to subtract off total cost. So there's what profit looks like. What I want to do is put together a little table here. Um, let's, let's put it over here. So let's put um, Q up here. Let's think about a firm that's going to be producing some uh, different levels of output. Let's go from zero up to eight. So we could think about this as maybe a, a dairy firm that's producing gallons of milk. Let's think about the price that they can sell milk for. Let's suppose milk sells for $6 a gallon. So the market demand curve and the market supply curve intersect at a price of $6. That's not under the control of the firm. The firm is a price taker. So the price that they can sell milk at is $6 whether they sell zero gallons of milk or eight gallons of milk or 20 gallons of milk. The price they can sell it for is $6. Now it could change tomorrow, it could change next week, but for right now we're going to focus on the situation they're in and right now they can sell any number of gallons they want at $6 each. From that we can calculate their total revenue. We just take price times quantity. Before we do that, let's remind ourselves of what I've got right here. Right here I've got the demand curve that the firm faces. If we were to graph that, this would be a picture at a quantity of zero. The firm can sell a gallon of milk for $6. At one, the price is six. At two, the price is six. So this would be a horizontal demand curve at a price of $6. So that's what I've got right there is the demand curve that the firm faces. Now let's figure out what total revenue looks like. Total revenue is just price times quantity. If they sell zero gallons of milk, 
they obviously get zero total revenue. One gallon of milk for $6, they earn $6 of revenue. Two at $6 each, that's 12. So you can see this is going up by six each time. So 18, 24, 30, 36, 42, up to 48. If they sell eight gallons at $6 each, they make 48. Now that's not profit, that's just total revenue right now. Okay. Let's think about a measure that we're going to call average revenue. I'm going to abbreviate average revenue, AR. Average revenue is just going to be total revenue divided by quantity. Remember that total revenue is just price times quantity. So average revenue, you can see these two Q's would cancel out. Average revenue we're going to see is always equal to price. That's going to be true for all firms. But we can calculate it right now if we want to figure out average revenue. We can take total revenue and divide it by Q. We can't divide by zero, so I'm not going to do it right there. If we sell one gallon of milk for six dollars of total revenue divided by the one gallon of milk, that's six. Twelve dollars divided by two, that's six. Eighteen divided by three, that's six. This is going to be six all the way down, and that should make sense because average revenue is equal to price, and price is six. And then finally, we can calculate what we're really after, and that's going to be marginal revenue. Marginal revenue, which we're going to abbreviate MR, marginal revenue is equal to the change in total revenue when you change quantity. And we're typically going to be thinking about a change in quantity of one unit. I can rewrite this this way. I can change, take these Greek deltas out and I can insert an English D. I get that marginal revenue is equal to the change in total revenue divided by the change in quantity. And that simply tells you that the marginal revenue is the slope of the total revenue curve. Okay. It's the change in total revenue when you change quantity. We can figure out what marginal revenue looks like here. Here's, we're going to be thinking about starting at zero and going to one. So I'm not going to calculate marginal revenue for the zero unit. I'm going to go to one. We can see that when we go from zero to one units, our total revenue goes from zero to six. So our change in total revenue was six dollars. When we go from one to two, our total revenue goes from six to 12, so again it changes by six dollars. From two to three, our total revenue goes from 12 to 18. It's always changing by six dollars. Six all the way down. So that leads us to the first important conclusion that we get from this, and that is for a perfectly competitive firm, price and marginal revenue are equal. Okay, that is important. We're going to use that. We will see that that will not be true for other types of firms. What I want to do now is clear this off and then we're going to reproduce part of this table and then we're going to link it up with some cost information and we're going to see what's the right quantity here to produce. So we've got some of the information from that previous table that we had. We've got our quantity and we've got the amount of revenue that they earn at each one of each level of quantity. Let's add to that some cost information. So let me give you some total cost numbers. Okay, so let's suppose the total cost, if they produce zero gallons of milk, their total cost is three dollars um, and then five, eight, 12, 17, 23, 30, 38, and 47. Now hopefully you remember that what this means is that fixed cost is equal to three dollars. Um, you could figure out what your variable cost is. Um, you could go through and figure out average fixed cost, average variable cost, average total cost. Let's go ahead and figure out just what profit is because we know profit is equal to total revenue minus total cost. So let's calculate our profit. If the firm produces no milk, 
they have no revenue, they incur $3 of cost, so their profit would be negative $3. They lose $3 if they don't produce anything. If they produce one gallon of milk, they're going to sell it for $6, they're going to incur $5 of cost, so they make profit of $1. The rest of these would look like this, four, six, seven, seven, six, four, one. First thing that we can see is that profit is not made in volume. You can see that if you think that profit's made in volume, then you would think, oh, we just need to produce and sell as much milk as possible. But what's happening is that profit initially goes up, it reaches a maximum, and then it starts to go back down, right? If we were to graph profit, here's what profit typically looks like. If we put profit on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis, profit is typically going to look like this. Profit is not made in volume. If you produce enough, you can drive your profit right back down to zero, and if you produce past that, you can drive your profit negative. What happens is we want to know where's this? What's the quantity that we should produce that maximizes the amount of profit that we can earn? And this is not profit per unit. This is the total amount of profit that you're going to earn. Let's put up here so we've just seen that right here, that's the place where profit is maximized. So what we can tell from this table is the firm should produce four or five gallons of milk. Now we can narrow this down a little bit more and so let's do that. But just by looking at the profit numbers, we can see, get a good idea of where this firm's going to want to be. Let's figure out what marginal revenue looks like. So we already knew that marginal revenue was always six, right? At each one of these levels of output, marginal revenue is six. Let's add up here marginal cost. So all we have to do is look at our change in total cost. So if we go, we're not going to calculate it here. We need to go from zero to one. If we look at what happens, our marginal, right here, our marginal cost goes from, our total cost goes from three to five. So our marginal cost is two. Then from five to eight, it's three. Then from eight to 12, it's four. You can see that our marginal cost is going up by a dollar each time. It's going to be five six, seven, eight, nine. There's the marginal cost. Now let's look, we already know where profit is maximized. It's right in here, but let's look at what's happening to marginal revenue and marginal cost right in there. What we see is that right in there, marginal revenue and marginal cost become equal. Every place down here, they are different. Marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. And then up here, marginal cost is greater than marginal revenue. So what we can see is that in order to maximize profit, the firm is going to produce the quantity where marginal revenue and marginal cost are equal. Right there is the place where profit is maximized. So let's put up here, profit is maximized when marginal revenue is exactly equal to marginal cost. That's going to be very important. This is gonna be true for all firms. To maximize profit, any firm out there is going to produce the quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Let's just kind of take it one gallon at a time and, and think about a few different decisions that the firm would need to make. So let's suppose we didn't know this, suppose we didn't have this table put together, Let's suppose we were just thinking about the first gallon of milk. Well, if we were thinking about the first gallon, so let's put up here a first gallon of milk. For the first gallon of milk, marginal revenue is equal to six and the marginal cost is equal to two. So if we think about what's going on there, remember the decision rule for a decision maker, the rule for a decision maker is that you take an action if and only if the marginal benefit's bigger than the marginal cost. Well, in this case, marginal cost is obvious. The marginal benefit to the firm would be the revenue that they earn. 
So this certainly passes the test. The firm would want to produce the first gallon of milk because it adds $6 to their revenue and only adds $2 to their cost. And then if we were to go to the second gallon of milk, then we see that, so for the second gallon, what we see is that the marginal revenue again is six, and now the marginal cost is different. Oops, it's three, but this still passes the test. Marginal revenue is still bigger than marginal cost, and so the firm would certainly want to produce the second gallon of milk. And this would be true about the third gallon of milk and the fourth gallon of milk. Let's skip over the fifth one for just a second. And let's go to the seventh gallon of milk. Okay, so let's put a little line here and let's just think about the seventh gallon. So would the firm want to produce the seventh gallon? Well, the seventh gallon, this one right down here, has a marginal revenue of $6 and a marginal cost of $8. So this gallon would add $6 to our revenue, but $8 to our cost. So we certainly would not want to produce that gallon. So you can see that any place up here, marginal revenue will be bigger than marginal cost. And we wouldn't want to stop here. We wouldn't want to stop there. As long as marginal revenue is bigger than marginal cost, you should do more of that. And we would never want to be down in this range because our marginal cost now is bigger than our marginal revenue. So if you're doing something and at the, for the level that you're doing it, the marginal cost is bigger than the marginal benefit, then you need to do less of that. So we never want to be back here. We never want to be down here. That just leaves right there for the place where marginal revenue is equal to uh, marginal cost. Let me just show you as an aside, profit is equal to total revenue minus total cost. The profit function looks like this. If you want to maximize a function, then what we need to do is we need to find the place. Right up here is the maximum. And what we see is that at that maximum, the slope is equal to zero. So all we need to do is find the place where the slope of profit function is equal to zero. Well, here's the profit function. If we want to find the place where the slope is equal to zero, we need to take the derivative of this. I will not ask you to do this on a test. You do not need to know how to take a derivative. You don't need to reproduce this. I just want you to see from a calculus perspective why this has to be true. If we take the derivative of profit with respect to quantity, that's equal to the derivative of total revenue with respect to quantity minus the derivative of total cost with respect to quantity. Here's the slope, and we want that slope to be equal to zero. This is just the definition of marginal revenue. It's the change in total revenue when you change quantity. So this says that marginal revenue minus, this is marginal cost. It's the change in total cost when you change quantity. This says that for profit to be maximized, marginal revenue minus marginal cost must be equal to zero. If we move that to the other side, this says marginal revenue has to be equal to marginal cost. So we can prove that this has to be true. Now we're just simply looking at it a different way. We don't need to do the calculus of it to be able to see that profit is maximized where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. What we want to do now is, is clear this off and then think about what this looks like graphically. And it's, we'll see that it's actually very easy to apply this given the cost curves that we've learned about. Let's graph the uh, marginal revenue and demand curves that we had. I erased the table there, but let's think about what those look like. So we drew the demand curve that the firm faced. In this particular example, the demand curve that the firm faced was horizontal at the market price. So it looked like that. There's the demand curve. Remember, our marginal revenue column was all a bunch of sixes also. So at a quantity of zero, it was six. And at a quantity of one, it was six. And at a quantity of eight, it was six. So at all of these quantities, it was also six. That means that the marginal revenue curve lies right on top of 
the demand curve that the firm faces. So there's the marginal revenue curve that the firm faces. So now what we want to do is we want to take this picture and put it together with our uh, cost curve picture that we talked about in a previous chapter. And then we'll be able to see that it's very easy to identify where marginal revenue and marginal cost are equal for a firm. So let's think about the firm's marginal cost curve and its supply decision. So I'm going to draw a competitive firm. So here's a firm Q P. Let's think about the cost curves. So remember we've got a marginal cost curve that's upward sloping. We've got an average total cost curve and we've got an average variable cost curve. There's the cost curves for a firm. Our average curves are U-shaped and they intersect that marginal cost curve at the bottom of the average curves. What we want to do now, so this represents the costs of the firm, we want to put in here the revenue of the firm. So I'm going to actually move mine up a little bit. I'm going to do it in a different color. I don't know if this will show up as a different color, but let's suppose the market price is right there. There's our market price. So we know that the marginal revenue curve is going to be horizontal at the market price. So we can draw our marginal revenue curve up here. There's marginal revenue. It's equal to the demand curve that the firm faces. And we also know that what we're looking for is we're looking for the place where marginal revenue and marginal cost are equal. Well, here's marginal revenue. Here's marginal cost. Right there is the place where marginal revenue and marginal cost are equal in that picture. And so the profit maximizing quantity for this firm to produce is right there. I'm going to call it Q star. There is the profit maximizing quantity for this competitive firm to produce. If they produce any less than that, they're not going to be maximizing profit. And if they produce any more than that, they will not be maximizing profit. Let's draw another picture here where we think about a little bit more about why other quantities do not maximize profit. In this picture, I'm just going to put the marginal cost and let's just put the marginal revenue curve. Let's suppose right there is the market price. I'll put the marginal revenue curve. It's right there. So the profit maximizing quantity for this firm to produce would be right here. Let's think about this quantity. Let's think about what the problem is at that, with that quantity. Well, here's the problem. We can go up from that quantity to see what the marginal cost is. So right there would be, let's call that Q1, here's marginal cost 1. That's the marginal cost of producing that quantity. We can go up to the marginal revenue and see the marginal revenue of producing that quantity. We'll call it MR1. So you can see why we don't want to stop at Q1. At Q1, the marginal revenue is bigger than the marginal cost. And so we certainly do want to produce Q1, but we don't want to stop there, right? We could produce this quantity or this quantity or this quantity, and the marginal revenue for all of those will be bigger than the marginal cost. That's going to be true all the way up to this point. At that point, the marginal revenue is no longer bigger than the marginal cost. They are equal, so we stop increasing. Let's think about this quantity right here, Q2. Why would we not want to produce a quantity higher than, let's go ahead and call that Q star. Well, at Q2, if we go up, we can see that here's the marginal revenue, call it MR2. And if we go up here, we see that there's the marginal cost, MC2. So we can see that for that quantity Q2, the marginal cost is bigger than the marginal revenue. That doesn't pass the test. We don't want to produce Q2 because we get less in terms of our revenue at the margin than the costs that we incur at the margin. So we don't want to produce any quantity to the left of Q star. We don't want to produce any quantity to the right of Q star. That just leaves Q star as the right quantity to produce. Okay. 
So now we can understand very easily how the firm is going to choose the profit maximizing quantity to produce. It all depends on where the market price is. If the market price was lower, then our marginal revenue curve would be horizontal at a lower price and we would see where that marginal revenue curve intersects the marginal cost curve and that would give us the quantity that they want to produce. So let's think about what would happen. Let's call this P1 and we'll call that Q1. Let's think about what would happen if the market price fell. So if the market price fell, and remember the thing that would cause the market price to fall would be something that happens over here in the market picture. This is the market price, but remember this is just one firm out of many that are in the market. This firm has no control over that price. So when the market drives the price down, there's nothing that this firm can do about it. Let's suppose the market drives, drives the price down to P2. When the price falls to P2, then what we see is we can draw the marginal revenue curve there. So this is our new marginal revenue curve. And now marginal revenue and marginal cost are equal at that point. And so what we see is that at a lower price, the firm will produce a smaller quantity. There would be the optimal quantity for the firm to produce at a price of P2. Okay. So when the market changes the price, then of course the firm will react. If the price goes down, the firm will react by producing less. If the price goes up, the firm will react by producing more. So what we see is that for the firm, the price quantity combination is always found along this marginal cost curve. Now if you think back to the very beginning when you first started learning about demand and supply, what you would have seen is that when we first introduce demand and supply, we draw a supply curve. And we say that a firm has a supply curve, it looks like this. What this tells us is that when the price is low, the firm wants to supply, say, this quantity, we'll call that P1, Q1. If the price goes up to, say, P2, the firm wants to supply a higher quantity, Q2. Sellers like high prices, so at higher prices they want to sell more. Well, what you should start to see real quickly is that what we were calling the supply curve back then is nothing more than the firm's marginal cost curve, right? The supply curve back then showed us the relationship between the price and the number of units that the firm wants to sell, which is exactly what is happening in this picture. If you ignore these average cost curves, just focus on the marginal cost curve. What you see is that for any price over here, all we do is go straight over to that marginal cost curve and that tells us the quantity that they're going to produce. So for a competitive firm, the marginal cost curve is its supply curve. So let's just put here, this is important, the marginal cost curve is the competitive firm's supply curve. Marginal cost curve is the competitive firm's supply curve. Now it turns out that not all of the marginal cost curve is important for us. So what we want to do now is think about how low the price can go and the firm still produce the quantity found by the marginal cost curve. So let's think about the, what we're going to call the short run decision to shut down. Short run decision to shut down. Now let's talk about what we mean when we say shut down. So shut down is simply going to be a short run decision to not produce anything. That's different from another decision that we'll talk about and that is the decision to exit a market. Okay, so if we're thinking about exiting, exit is a long run decision to leave the market. Shutdown is just a short run thing. Most firms shut down at night. So if you think about most um, businesses,
they shut their doors at night, they don't, they're not open, and then the next morning they open back up. Now the reason they shut their doors at night is because demand for their services is so low that it's just not worth it to be open. So they shut down. That's different from a firm that exits. If you're a firm and you exit, then you would sell all of the equipment, all of the buildings, you, you get out of the market. Okay, so shutdown is a short run decision. Exit, this is a long run decision. Okay, we're going to focus on this one. Let's focus on the short run decision to shut down. If you shut down, then let's say it this way. A firm that shuts down is able to reduce its variable cost to zero. But shutting down does not reduce your fixed cost to zero. So if we, let's say, a firm that shuts down, for that firm, of course, their total revenue will be equal to zero. If you shut down and you're not selling anything, then you bring in no revenue. But your variable cost is also equal to zero because if you shut down, you don't need any workers. So shutting down allows you to move your variable cost to zero. Fixed cost is not zero. Remember your fixed cost, you have to pay those no matter what. And the period of time during which you have to pay them is what we call the short run. So let's talk about what, when a firm will shut down. So a firm will shut down as long as the revenue that it earns from producing is greater than its variable cost. So let's write that. A firm shuts down if total revenue is less than variable cost. A firm shuts down if total revenue is less than variable cost. Now let's think about that for a second. And let me give you an example of when you've probably seen something like this and you might have thought about it but not thought about it in these terms. But if you've ever been at a restaurant, say for lunch, and let's suppose this is a popular restaurant in the evening, but let's say you're there at lunch and there's hardly anybody there. Let's say you're the only person there. And you're eating lunch and you're thinking to yourself, they can't be making money. I'm the only person in here, right? And, and for a lot of people, they see that and they don't understand it. Well, here's what's going on. You're probably right that they are not making money. Their profit is probably negative. But for a lot of people, they go from there to thinking that if your profit's negative, you shouldn't be open at all. But the reality of it is that there are going to be some times when your profit is negative and you should still be open. And it has to do with this. Okay, so... Let's work our way through this. A firm shuts down if its total revenue is less than its variable cost. Let me give you an example. We'll come back to this here in a second. Let me give you an example. Let's consider a business. Consider a business. And let's suppose that the fixed cost for this business is equal to $500. Let's suppose variable cost for this business is equal to $1,000. And let's suppose total revenue is equal to $1,200. Now let's think about what this business should do. So if the firm produces, remember profit is equal to total revenue minus total cost. So if they produce, if they produce, then our pro the profit of this business is going to be total revenue, which is $1,200, minus total cost. Now their total cost is going to be $1,500. So if they produce, they will lose $300. And your first reaction is to say, oh boy, that's a bad idea. Shouldn't be doing that. But now let's think about what's going to happen if they shut down. So if it shuts down, then we can calculate their profit. If they shut down, they get no revenue and they incur no variable cost, but they can't get out of their fixed cost. So if they shut down, they lose $500. So once you realize that the two options here 
are to either lose $300 or to lose $500, then you start to realize this is the best outcome. They will stay open and they will lose money, but they will lose less money by staying open than if they shut down. Okay. Now let's change this just a little bit. Let's do, um, let's suppose that now our fixed cost are 500. Let's suppose our variable cost is still a thousand. But now let's suppose our total revenue is only $900. Now let's think about what this firm's going to do. So if they produce, so let's figure out what their profit will be if they produce. If they produce, they're going to earn $900 of revenue minus the $1,500 of cost. They're going to lose $600 if they stay open. If they shut down, it's the same situation as over here. Their revenue would be zero. Their variable cost would be zero. They lose the fixed cost. If they shut down, their profit would be equal to not negative 500. So in this case, this firm will choose to shut down. They would rather lose $500 than $600. So notice that in one situation, they're going to produce. In the other situation, they're going to shut down. In every possible scenario that I've put up here, their profit is negative. But when your profit is negative, what it means to maximize profit is to lose the smallest amount possible. So there's nothing that the firm can do here they're going, they're on the hook for their fixed cost no matter what. Now let's think about what's different between this right here and what I've got right here. Notice I didn't change anything about my costs. All I did was right here my revenue is bigger than my, fic, my variable cost and down here my revenue is smaller than my variable cost. So what we get here is that a firm will shut down if its revenue is less than its variable cost. Not if profit's negative, but if revenue is less than variable cost. Now, let's take that right here and let's work with it a little bit. I want to change it. Let's do it right down here. So if we take, you're going to shut down if total revenue is less than variable cost. That's what we've got right there. I'm going to divide both sides by Q. I haven't changed anything. That says we're going to shut down if average revenue, that's the definition of average revenue, is less than, this is average variable cost. You're going to shut down if average revenue is less than average variable cost. Well, we saw just a little bit ago that average revenue is always equal to price. So this gets us this condition. You shut down if price falls below average variable cost. That's important. That's what we're going to call the firm's short run shutdown condition. So what I need to do is let's clear this off and then I'll show you what that looks like graphically. Let's take a look at what this shutdown condition looks like graphically. So remember our shutdown condition looks like this. You shut down if price falls below average variable cost. Okay. And let's for a second just think about why that makes sense. Because remember the firm that we had in our previous example, they had to pay their fixed cost no matter what. There's nothing they could do. That's the idea behind a fixed cost. You can't get out of it. So the question for the firm is, should we stay open? Should we bring our workers in and stay open or should we shut down? Well, if you can bring your workers in and cover all of the cost of your workers, then you're going to be able to cover, cover at least some of that fixed cost. So you lose less than the full fixed cost. So in that case, if you can bring your workers in and cover the cost of workers, the variable cost, then it's worth it to uh, stay open. On the other hand, if you're going to bring the workers in and you can't even cover all of that cost, 
then you shouldn't do it. So if your revenue is less than what your cost of workers, your variable cost would be, then you just shut down. Just, just lose the uh, fixed cost rather than also part of the variable cost. Now, we put this on a per unit basis. So the original example we had was you're going to shut down if your total revenue is less than your variable cost. That's true. This says the same thing. We're just putting it on a per unit basis. So if your price per unit is less than your average variable cost per unit, you shut down. And now we can put that, we can see what that looks like on our picture here. So if we've got our marginal cost, let's put our average total cost and our average variable cost. Here's what this says. This says that as long as the price stays above the bottom of that average variable cost curve, as long as it's up in here, you're fine. But if price ever falls down here below average variable cost, then you need to shut down. So the bottom of the average variable cost curve is right here. That's going to be what we're going to call the shutdown point. That's the price above which the firm will continue to produce and below which they are going to shut down. So as, as long as price is below that, they shut down, they produce nothing. That would be part of the firm's supply curve. I'm going to connect these with a, a line here. Once the price gets above this point, that's that minimum average variable cost, then the supply curve is the marginal cost curve. We would just draw wherever our price was, we would draw the marginal revenue curve over, see where it intersected marginal cost. So this is the competitive firm's short run supply curve. Competitive firm's short run supply curve. It's the marginal cost curve all the way down to the bottom of the average variable cost curve and then from that point on down it's the vertical axis. Okay, they would shut down, they would produce nothing at those prices. So that's what our shutdown condition looks like. Let's think now about sunk costs. Let's talk a little bit about what a sunk cost is. We would call a cost sunk if it's already been committed and it can't be recovered. So you've probably heard something about sunk costs. Somebody may have said something to you but like, don't cry over spilt milk. And the idea there is that once the milk has been spilt, it doesn't matter what you do from that point on, you can't undo that. So in terms of making good decisions from that point on, it's not useful to cry over the fact that the milk was spilt. Okay, so once a cost has been committed and can't be recovered, then it's not useful for making good decisions. It's very different from an opportunity cost. Remember, an opportunity cost, the magnitude of the cost depends on the behavior that you engage in. You have control over an opportunity cost. You can change your behavior and change its magnitude. A sunk cost, you can't. What this means is, that sunk costs are not useful for good decision making. Okay, so not useful for decision making. So if there's something that you can't control, you need to avoid thinking about it for making decisions from this point on. That doesn't mean that you can't feel bad about it, but it's not useful for making decisions. The example that I usually use in class would be, let's suppose that, uh, let's suppose you have two options to choose from, A and B. And let's suppose the first characteristic of option A is you lose your car. And the first characteristic, that should say car. <laughs> the first characteristic of option B is you lose your car. Let's suppose the second characteristic of option A is you lose your house. And the second characteristic of option B, you lose your house. The third characteristic of option A is you flunk this class. 
The third characteristic of option B is you pass this class. Now, if you have to choose between A and B, then what you start to realize real quickly is this is not useful for making good decisions. It doesn't distinguish between A and B. You're going to lose your car no matter whether you choose A or you choose B. So we could erase that off the board because it's not useful for good decision making. It's also the case that this is not useful. You're going to lose your house whether you choose A or B. So you've lost your car and you've lost your house. The only thing that's different between A and B is that with A you flunk this class and with B you pass this class. These two things are the only pieces of information that are useful for distinguishing between A and B. These things are sunk costs. Sunk costs are not good for making decisions. Only the things that you have control over are good for making decisions. Let's think about why this matters. If we think about what happens in this picture, let's suppose we go to this picture and let's think about what would happen in this picture if we change the magnitude of fixed costs. If we were to change the magnitude of fixed costs, remember that fixed costs, average fixed costs show up as the difference between these two curves right here. We saw that in a previous chapter. So if I were to increase fixed cost, our var average variable cost curve doesn't shift, but this average total cost curve sh is going to shift up. Well, notice that changing our fixed cost is not going to have any impact on the firm's supply curve because the thing that determines the firm's supply curve is this average variable cost curve. It's the marginal cost curve all the way down to that point. It doesn't matter where that average total cost curve is. It could be up here, could be down here, it could be right there. That doesn't matter. So what we're seeing here is that the firms are going to ignore their fixed costs when they make production decisions. That's counterintuitive for a lot of students. I can put on a test, true or false, firms ignore their fixed costs for making product, when making production decisions. And students will say, oh gosh, surely, surely well-run firms are not going to ignore anything. And so they'll, they'll answer false, but that's true. Firms ignore their fixed costs when making production decisions. So, now let's think about the long run decision to exit. So long run decision, I'm going to say to enter or exit. Because we can think about when firms will want to enter a market, when firms will want to exit a market. And this one's actually easy to understand. If you're, if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking for a market to enter, you're going to enter the market where the profits are being made, the profits are being made that are positive. You're not going to be entering a market where firms are losing money. So a firm exits the market if their profit is negative. A firm will exit if total revenue is less than total cost. A firm will enter if profit's positive, if total revenue greater than total cost. Now let's manipulate this one for a second. We're going to exit if total revenue is less than total cost. I'm going to do the same thing that I did with my short run shutdown condition. I'm going to take it total revenue less than total cost. I'm going to divide by Q. This is average revenue. So they're going to exit if average revenue is less than average total cost. Average revenue is equal to price. So a firm will exit if price is less, that should be average total cost. Firm exits if price is less than average total cost. This is just another way of saying that you exit if profit is negative. So let's think about what that means. If we wanted to think about the firm's long run supply curve, let me draw a picture of it right down here. So if we thought about, let's put on here the firm's marginal cost curve. 
and then we're going to put average total cost here. We would not need to put an average variable cost because all costs are variable in the long run. So our average variable cost curve would be the same as that average total cost curve. All costs are variable. But what this tells us is the firm's long run supply curve is the portion of its marginal cost curve all the way down to where price is equal to the bottom of that average total cost curve. If price ever falls below average total cost, then the firm is going to exit the market. They would produce nothing. So this would be the part of the long run supply curve. I'm going to connect it with a line. And then the rest of the firm's long run supply curve would be its marginal cost curve above that average total cost curve. This is the competitive firm's long run supply curve. It is the portion of the marginal cost curve above the average total cost curve. So now let's think about kind of the competitive firm's profit maximizing strategy. How does a competitive firm maximize profit? Well, here's the first rule. You produce the quantity, produce the quantity where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. But now here's what we've seen. For a competitive firm, we've seen that price is equal to marginal revenue. Well, if price equals marginal revenue and marginal revenue equals marginal cost, then the profit maximizing condition for a firm is to produce the quantity where price equals marginal cost. That is extremely important. Produce the quantity where price equals marginal cost. The way that looks is we've got our marginal cost curve here. We know that all the firm does is it looks where that marginal revenue curve intersects marginal cost. There's the quantity. Okay. But now what we've seen is that that doesn't happen at every price. We've now got some ranges. What we see here is that in the short run, if price were ever to fall below the bottom of the average variable cost curve, the firm is going to shut down. They will produce nothing. That's what the short run looks like. In the long run, they would exit the market if price were ever below average total cost. Okay, so our short run firm supply curve has this little portion on it right here. That little tail, the firm would be losing money. Profit would be negative for a price in between this range. Profit, any price down in here, profit will be negative, but the firm will still produce a positive quantity. But if price were to ever fall down here, they shut down. Okay? So this gives us a good idea of um, what the firm's supply curve looks like in the short run and the long run. Their marginal cost curve is the supply curve, but not all of it. This little tail of the marginal cost curve down below the bottom of the average variable cost, that's irrelevant. The firm never pays attention to it. What we want to do now is clear this off and we'll take a look at what profit looks like for a perfectly competitive firm. Let's talk for just a second about how to visually see the magnitude of profit on the picture that we're, um, we've been drawing for the firm. Let's talk first about uh, what profit looks like algebraically. So let's think about profit. Profit's equal to total revenue minus total cost. So I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, manipulating things here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply and divide each of these by Q. So if I take total revenue times quantity divided by quantity, I haven't changed anything minus total cost multiplied by quantity divided by quantity. That's another way to write profit. And again, these Q's would cancel and those Q's would cancel. I haven't really done anything. But now I can recognize that's average revenue 
and that is average total cost. So we can write it this way. This is equal to P times Q minus average total cost times Q. Now, if you're looking at this, you might be saying, hold it, why did we go through this step, right? We ended up with total revenue is equal to P times Q. We already knew that, and you're right. I mean, this is really kind of an unnecessary step to go through, but we get to the same place in the end, and it, and it demonstrates that a lot of times there's more than one way to get to the answer that you're thinking about. What we can do now is we can factor out Q. So I can write profit is equal to price minus average total cost multiplied by Q. And this is an important version of profit that you need to remember. This is what profit looks like in total if we're thinking about total revenue and total cost. This is what profit looks like on a per unit basis. And remember the pictures that we're drawing are a per unit basis. We're talking about average revenue and marginal revenue and marginal cost. So we're thinking about it per unit. This term right there, that's just profit per unit. Whatever the price is minus your cost on average, this is how much profit you make per unit. So if you can sell it for $10 and on average it costs you $8 to make it, then you make $2 per unit. And then if we just multiply that by the number of units that you produce and sell, then that gives us total profit. So this and this say the exact same thing. They're just different ways of looking at it. Okay? But now this one we can graph. So let's take a look at what that looks like graphically. I'm going to put up here um, a marginal cost curve and an average total cost curve. And let's put a price up here. Let's suppose that the price for this good is right here. There's the market determined price. The firm didn't have any control over that. Now we can draw the marginal revenue curve. We know that the marginal revenue curve comes over like that. There's marginal revenue. We look where marginal revenue equals marginal cost and that happens right here. So the firm is going to produce that quantity. That's their profit maximizing quantity. Now if we want to identify profit, we've got price, we've got quantity right here. Now what we need is average total cost. Well, if we go up from this quantity to the average total cost curve, we hit it right there. There's the average total cost of producing that particular level of output. Now we've got the three things we need. This distance right here, this is price minus average total cost. This distance right there is that term. And then this distance right here is Q, right? The distance from the origin out to the quantity is Q. If, if the quantity were 90, then this distance would be 90 units. So what this says is this vertical distance multiplied by a horizontal distance is profit. That's telling us that the area of this rectangle is equal to the profit that this firm earns. That is profit greater than zero. This firm is earning a positive profit. The reason they are earning a positive profit is that their price is greater than their average total cost curve, or it's greater than average total cost. Any price that is up above the average total cost curve will create a positive profit for the firm. All right? If price is equal to average total cost, then this term would be equal to zero, and then zero times Q is zero. Profit would be equal to zero. Let's draw a picture of a perfectly competitive firm earning a negative profit. So let's put our marginal cost curve up here. Here's average total cost. Now what we need for profit to be negative is we need average total cost to be bigger than price. Well, that's easy. All I would need to do is put my price somewhere down, some where down below the average total cost curve. So if I put it right here, suppose there's my price. Then I draw my marginal revenue curve. I look where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That happens right here. There's the quantity. I go up from that quantity until I hit the average total cost curve, and I hit it right there. 
So there's average total cost. This area would represent the loss the firm earns. This firm would earn a profit that is negative, a profit that's less than zero. So you can see that if price is above that average total cost curve, above the bottom of it, then the profit's going to be positive. If price were below the bottom of this average total cost curve, like it is here, profit is negative. Let's just finish up here by thinking about where the price would need to be for profit to be equal to zero. So if we had our marginal cost curve and our average total cost right here, Well, if price is ever above the bottom of this average total cost curve, profit's positive. And if price is ever below the bottom, it's negative, which means that if price were right there, then we would draw the marginal revenue curve. It would intersect right there. There's marginal revenue. It intersects right there. There is the quantity that the firm would produce. And in this case, the profit for the firm would be equal to zero. So you can see that it's very easy to see what profit looks like visually on this picture. So let's kind of review what we've done here. So we talked about what the revenue look curve looks like for a um, perfectly competitive firm, in particular the marginal revenue curve, and we saw that it's horizontal at the market price. We know that the firm maximizes profit by producing the quantity where marginal revenue and marginal cost are equal. So graphically, all we have to do is draw this horizontal line at the market price and see where it hits the marginal revenue curve. That gives us the uh, quantity the firm's going to produce. We talked about the short run shutdown condition and we saw that the marginal cost curve is the supply curve, but only down to the bottom of that average variable cost curve in the short run. We talked about the firm's long run supply curve, and that's going to be the marginal cost curve down to the average total cost curve. And then we talked about how to identify profit. What we're going to do in our next video is we're going to think about what the market supply curves look like. These are the firm supply curves, the marginal cost curve. We still need to think about what the market supply curve looks like in the short run and what the market supply curve looks like in the long run. And then in our next video, we're going to talk about what happens in a market. How do these markets function when we put lots of firms together with each other? So I'll see you in the uh, part two of this.